Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. Good night, Dad. Good night, my sunshine. Should I leave the light on for you? Just the moon. Barney smiled and turned off the main light, leaving a moon-shaped nightlight on. Is that okay? His daughter nodded contentedly. Well then, sleep tight. Barney left the children's room, carefully closing the door behind him. He walked to the kitchen, fetched a bottle of whiskey from the top drawer, carefully hidden behind jars of grains. He poured himself a drink in a mug. If his daughter suddenly woke up and ran to the kitchen, she'd think dad was having tea, and he drank. It warmed him inside. Of course, it wouldn't make him forget today's events, but at least he could calmly think about it now. Several hours earlier, Barney and his daughter had left the supermarket. He always checked the receipt to ensure everything was counted correctly, while Wendy walked beside him. Without lifting his head, Barney automatically headed home. Suddenly, Wendy's joyful cry rang out. Dad, Mom is crying by the store there. He raised his head, not expecting to see his wife. She had passed away three years ago. Of course, their daughter knew about it. There was a dirty homeless woman near the small old shop. No, he thought, that can't be. There was a definite resemblance. A young woman around 30, about Anna's height, with dark hair like his wife's, or maybe just so dirty that it wasn't clear. She was dressed in incomprehensible old clothes, covered in dirt, her facial features resembled, but Barney had poor eyesight, so from that distance, he couldn't see clearly. Dad, why are you standing there? Wendy shouted. That's mom. Let's go to her. She pulled him with a non-childish force toward the dirty woman. Barney noticed passersby starting to look at them. He felt ashamed. Wendy, he said sternly, what are you doing? Stop it. She's just some homeless woman. At that moment, he looked up, and it seemed the woman heard him. She covered her tear-stained face with her hands, turned away, and ran from them. Mom, Wendy screamed desperately, wanting to run after her. He tightly grasped his daughter's hand, causing her to scream in pain and look at her father in surprise. Wendy, stop, he repeated, that's not our mom. You imagined it. Doubt flickered in his daughter's gaze. Dimitri swallowed the lump in his throat and said. You know mom passed away. It's just a woman who looks like her. Wendy started crying, softly, almost soundlessly. She nodded, lowered her head, and seemed to deflate as if he had stolen her last hope. Wendy silently walked beside him. He wanted to stop her, to hug her. But he had bags of groceries in his hands, so he just walked alongside his daughter. Barney and Anna didn't have a classic love story. At least not one described in books. They met by chance, in a place they both didn't intend to go. It was city day, the beginning of June, hot during the day but still cool in the evening. The Standard Entertainment Program, a parade of local companies advertising their construction firms, pies, nail salons, dental clinics, and other services needed by the population. Closer to the evening, a concert, followed by fireworks on the waterfront. It's going to be so crowded there, Anna complained to her colleague Garfield, with whom they were on duty that day. And so what? Garfield asked cheerfully. He was three years younger than Anna, just graduated from medical college, and had been working in their department for only two months. We'll be hanging around here after work, she explained, and then it'll be crowded till evening. After the concert and fireworks, all the buses will be packed as usual. Can't even get a taxi. Come on, her colleague interrupted, Anna, seriously, you complain as if you're 70 years old, not 24. Do you think at 70 you won't want to go anywhere? Mrs. Lewis, the orderly, chimed in, I'm going to the festival after I get home. See, Garfield said expressively. Anna rolled her eyes and said, okay, you've convinced me. But if it gets boring. Oh, come on, only boring people get bored. Fun people have fun everywhere. Have you been bored with me even for a day? To that argument, the girl just snorted and went into the procedural room. Soon the next shift will arrive. 
everything should be in order by their appearance. In general, it was Garfield's responsibility, but since he was new, Anna preferred to check everything herself. The drip stands were disinfected and placed in the corner, all surfaces were clean, the medicine and solution cabinets were in order, and the trash bins were empty. Satisfied, Anna nodded and left the procedure room to return to her post. Dictator, did you check everything? Garfield asked her. He was filling out journals and arranging pills for the evening shift. Everything is perfect. You're doing great, learning fast. Thanks. Are you going to check how I've arranged the pills too? Oh, stop it, don't grumble. Go on, change your clothes. I'll finish my shift and catch up. Okay. Anna smiled, waved. Goodbye. To Mrs. Lewis, who was finishing cleaning the last ward, and went to change. Miss King, her shift replacement, was already in the changing room. Hi, Anna. Hello. How did everything go? Anna shrugged. According to plan. Garfield will tell you more. He's doing a great job. That's true. Are you going to the City Day celebration? Yeah, thought I'd go. Right decision, no point in staying home all the time. Miss King glanced at herself in the mirror, adjusted her bangs, and left. Anna also looked in the mirror. Her appearance was something else, thick black hair just above her shoulders, tousled, dark circles around her black eyes, herself, pale, with an unhappy face. I probably need to get out of the house more often, Anna gloomily said to herself, I'm turning into some kind of scarecrow. She quickly changed into denim shorts and a white t-shirt, tidied up her hair. Well, that's better already. What, friend, started talking to yourself? Garfield, who had quietly entered the changing room, asked. Get out of here, kid, Anna replied harmlessly, change your clothes. She turned away more out of habit. She and Garfield immediately established purely friendly relations. Among the medical staff, shyness was not widespread. There were never separate dressing rooms for boys and girls here, and young medical students got used to not feeling embarrassed about showing their bodies, almost from the first year. I suggest combining business with pleasure, said Garfield, pulling on his shorts, let's eat and watch the concert. Anna smiled, how's that? The whole square will probably be crowded already. I know a great place. Barney planned to spend city day at home. He was tired after work and most of all wanted to come home, take a shower, and go to bed. But suddenly his phone rang. It was his elder sister. She worked for a major pharmaceutical company and spent almost all her time on business trips. I'm in town, she said without preamble, let's meet. Barney had warm relations with Buffy, especially since the last time he saw her was almost three months ago. Definitely. How long are you here for? Leaving tomorrow at 8.40. In the morning? Of course. Darn. I'm tired from work, wanted to rest today. I see, Buffy said in a cold tone, sweet dreams. May you dream of. I don't know, your beloved sister. He chuckled, I didn't say no. Where shall we meet? I have work in the city center today. City Day is a good opportunity to promote the company. You're a big boss. Are you really going to work yourself? I won't be there myself, but I need to oversee that the young staff do everything properly. Let's meet downtown, I'll send you the address. Okay. So Anna and Barney found themselves in the same place, practically at the same time. It was a small pizzeria on the second floor of a building near the city's central square. From here, they had a good view of the square, the stages with musicians, and the huge crowd of celebrating townspeople. Apparently, many had the idea to watch the festival from here because there were hardly any free tables in the cafe. Anna finally got her pizza, took the largest slice, happily watching the thin, long cheese string trailing behind it. As she was about to bring this masterpiece to her mouth, someone pushed her arm from behind, causing her to exclaim, barely keeping the slice from dropping. Anna turned around and saw a handsome young man looking at her with fear in his eyes. He nervously ran his hand through his brown hair, gazing at her with beautiful blue eyes. 
Sorry, he said, I didn't mean to. It's just very cramped here. Indeed, the tables were placed very close together. We're just here after work, Garfield jumped in cheerfully, really hungry, that's why Anna reacted like that. Otherwise, she's quite harmless. Doesn't bite even. Oh, then, perhaps we'll treat you? Buffy unexpectedly offered, as an apology. She smiled brightly at Garfield and adjusted her hair. If it were up to me, the medical worker immediately replied, I would gladly accept your charming smile, but I think my friend wouldn't refuse a treat. Anna rolled her eyes, see, Garfield is always like that. Won't miss an opportunity for himself, even manages to flirt. Anna, she said, extending her hand to the unfamiliar blonde man, and this is Garfield, my friend. The stranger smiled, Barney, he replied, and this is Buffy, my sister. Since things turned out this way, I suggest combining tables, Buffy proposed. Great idea, Anna replied. From the first glance, it was clear that Buffy and Garfield liked each other. There are some people who always know what they want from life and immediately recognize others who want the same. Although Anna had not known Garfield for long and had only seen Buffy and Barney for the first time, it was evident that there was a connection between her colleague and Buffy, and between Barney's sister and Garfield. Anna herself never knew how to easily make acquaintances, although she considered herself quite a social person. She knew she could never just strike up a conversation with a random person on the street like Garfield could. Fifteen awkward minutes later, Buffy was already laughing heartily at Garfield's story about transporting a 100-kilogram grandmother on a broken stretcher through the entire hospital. Barney and Anna just awkwardly glanced at each other. Obviously, they were no longer needed by these two and it was time to start their own conversation, but apparently, neither of them was able to do that. When lunch was over, Garfield suggested, shall we go closer to the stage? Maybe take a stroll instead? Buffy asked. We can stroll, Garfield immediately agreed. They left the pizzeria and headed to the waterfront. Buffy and Garfield were ahead, and there was nothing left for Anna and Barney to do but follow them. After ten awkward minutes, Barney finally decided to speak up. So, you and Garfield work together. Anna nodded, yes, at the third hospital. Cool. How about switching to informal communication? Yes, I agree. And where do you work? In a construction company. I'm an architect. That's something. Cool. Yeah, I like it. How about you at work? Do you like it? Anna shrugged, it varies. Sometimes everything is calm and according to plan, boring but good. Other times, they bring in a patient, and you run around, giving injections, setting up IVs, taking them for tests and examinations. By the end of the day, they feel better, safe, thank you, and you're happy. But then there are days when you just want to throw everything to hell. When there's a lot of work, clarified Barney. Not exactly. A lot of work isn't scary when it's productive. But when a doctor or the head nurse shouts at me for no reason, or I have a difficult patient, or we're expecting an inspection, and you spend the whole day on pins and needles. That's what I don't like. Barney smiled. Yeah, interesting work. Yeah, what do you do in your free time? He pondered, nothing particularly special, I suppose. I hang out with friends, sometimes play volleyball. Not professionally, just to stay fit. How about you? It was Anna's turn to contemplate, I don't have much free time. I work a lot these days, but sometimes when I do, I enjoy watching old black and white movies. Wow. You're the first person in my life who's into that. Anna chuckled. Yeah, I'm not very modern. No, I didn't mean that. On the contrary, it's great. Barney thought for a moment and added, if you'd like, we could watch together sometime. Anna raised her eyebrows in surprise. Barney realized how it sounded and hastily added, I didn't mean it that way. And, surely there are theaters that show them. We could go there. Anna smiled, Barney, I'm not a little girl, and an invitation to watch a movie won't surprise, scare, or offend me. Even if it's not at the theater, but at your place or mine. He grinned, I really didn't mean that. 
You're very beautiful, but I'm not trying to rush things. Me neither, replied Anna, despite the fact that you're also very handsome. Yet, events that evening hurried themselves along, all thanks to Garfield and Buffy. They had already decided how they would spend the evening and informed everyone after all four of them admired the fireworks. Barney, said the older sister in an unwavering tone, we're coming to your place. He cleared his throat. I think I'll head home, Anna said. Garfield's face fell. Barney quickly said, no, no, no. Everyone's coming to my place, I'd be glad, he added, looking straight at Anna. Anna frowned doubtfully, and Barney whispered, please, don't leave me alone with them. Buffy said, the taxi is on its way. Boys, you'll stop by the store on the way. Sure thing, Garfield added cheerfully. When they arrived at the apartment, Anna was surprised at how clean it was. Bachelor guys usually weren't particularly tidy. Maybe he has a girlfriend? No, then he probably wouldn't have invited them here. It's very cozy, Garfield voiced her thoughts. Thanks, Barney replied shortly and disappeared into the kitchen. He's always been like this since childhood, Buffy said, relaxing back into the couch, loved cleanliness so much, he'd even tidy up my room when I was too lazy. Can you imagine? It's not out of a love for cleanliness, said Barney, appearing in the living room with glasses in hand, but because we'd both be punished for leaving the house messy. Well, that too, Buffy didn't argue. Barney skillfully poured wine into glasses. Garfield washed and cut fruits. Here's to a great meeting, said Anna's partner, smiling and not taking his eyes off Barney's sister. Buffy smiled back at him and raised her glass. The evening went on cheerfully. Of course, Garfield and Buffy did most of the talking. Barney and Anna mainly stayed quiet, sipping wine. I think I'm ready, said Anna. What do you mean, ready? Barney didn't understand. I'm tipsy, she explained somewhat doomedly. He laughed, that's fixable. Let's go to the balcony, get some fresh air. You'll feel better right away. You have a balcony here? Yeah. Even there, Barney's place was tidy. Would you look at that? Anna shook her head, all normal people keep skis and pickle jars here. And he has a table, two chairs, and neatly folded blankets. Well, excuse me, Barney said offendedly, settling into a chair and unfolding a blanket, need a cover? Anna nodded, and he gently draped one of the blankets over her shoulders, then unfolded the second and placed it over her legs. And what about you? I'm fine without it. So they sat for about ten minutes. Although it was only the fifth floor, there was a decent view of the night summer city from there. They could even hear the cicadas chirping, and somewhere far below, a group of teenagers was laughing. I could sit here all night, Anna dreamily said. So, what's the problem? I'm not kicking you out. She smiled and stood up, let's go, the guys have probably lost us. But the room was empty. Only a strange sound was coming from the corridor. Barney and Anna went towards the sound and saw Buffy struggling to fasten her sandals, while Garfield was already putting on his sneakers. Where are you off to? Barney asked them. Buffy lifted her head and looked at her brother. Going for a walk, she replied. Seriously? She sighed and rolled her eyes. I want to show Garfield the beautiful room the pharmaceutical company booked for me in the hotel. Any more questions? Anna noticed Garfield blushing slightly. No more questions, Barney replied with a smile. Enjoy the view. Thanks. Garfield coughed. The taxi's here. And, of course, you guys enjoy yourselves, bookworms, said Buffy, taking Garfield's hand and leading him downstairs. Thanks, her brother replied. When the new couple disappeared behind the door, Anna said, it's time for me to go, too. Can I ask you to make me some tea while I wait for the taxi? Tea I can do, said Barney. But why a taxi? You're off tomorrow, aren't you? I am, but I can't stay overnight at your place. Why? Barney nodded toward the couch. It folds out, quite comfortable. Do you want to sleep? Not right now. 
then I suggest we watch a movie. A black and white one, just like you prefer. Anna chuckled, sure, let's do it. Then pick a movie. I'll put the kettle on. Actually, I only have poppy seed rolls and a gift box of cherry brandy chocolates or something like that, I can't remember. Working in the hospital taught me to eat anything. Rolls and chocolates sound perfect. When the kettle boiled, Barney returned with a tray holding two cups and a plate of rolls and chocolates. What did you choose? he asked. Hitchcock's The Birds. I've heard a lot about that director, but I haven't watched any of his movies. Really? Anna turned to him curiously. Not even Psycho? First time hearing about it. Then we should start with that. She decisively switched to the suggested movie. They comfortably settled on the floor in front of the couch on a thick, plush rug. The tea was finished within the first half hour. Barney and Anna watched the movie for about the same amount of time, hugging, and then Barney turned to ask her something, but Anna kissed him. Surprise flashed in his eyes. Sorry, she quickly backed away, I thought you wanted. Wait, he interrupted, that's what I wanted too. Anna woke up in the morning to the glaring sunlight. It was early, Barney was still asleep. She carefully got out from under the blanket, quickly washed up, got dressed, looked at herself in the mirror, and called a taxi. Where are you off to so early, she heard Barney's sleepy voice. Anna turned around, he was stretching in bed, smiling at her. I have plans for today, she said, sorry for leaving without warning. It was nice meeting you. Will we see each other again? Barney asked as she got up and headed to the door. Of course, Anna replied. In reality, she doubted it. She hadn't had this kind of experience before, but common sense told her that such encounters never led to anything serious. However, Barney turned out to be a good guy. He messaged her, called her, suggested meeting. Anna declined, not because she didn't want to see him, but because she genuinely had a lot of work. Barney had given up hope when, almost a month and a half later, he received a message from Anna, Hi. Let's meet today at 7 at our pizza place. He was surprised, but glad she reached out. I'll be there. Anna sat at the same table as the first time. Barney felt she was troubled by something. Hi, Barney said cheerfully, I'm glad you made time for me in your busy schedule. Hi. She didn't even smile. Anna, is something wrong? The girl nodded, biting her lip. I'm pregnant. Barney slowly sank into his chair. What, he bluntly asked. Anna took a slow breath, exhaling, and repeated loudly and slowly, as if speaking to a deaf person, Barney, I'm pregnant. For several seconds, he processed what she said, then asked an even more foolish question, from me? Anna sighed. No, not from you. I just wanted to share interesting information. We are such close friends. Seeing him still looking at her with an empty gaze, Anna said, from you, Barney. He nodded slowly. I understand. What do you plan to do? I don't know. I feel like there's only one way out. You and I barely know each other, and I absolutely did not plan to have a child now. But I decided that you should know. Barney cleared his throat. I think if you were sure about your decision, you wouldn't have told me. She looked at him, and he understood he was right. Barney sat closer and gently took her hand. I understand that we don't know each other well, but I'm a good person, Anna, and I like you. So whatever you decide, I'll support you. Anna bit her lip. She took a deep breath again and looked him straight in the eyes. Even if I decide to keep the baby? Yes, Barney firmly replied, I'll help you. He kept his word. They met almost every day for the next few months. Barney accompanied her to all the checkups, met her after work. Anna stayed at his place on weekends. Three months later, while sitting on the couch eating pizza, he said, maybe we should get married? Anna almost choked on her pizza. Who taught you to propose like that? He smiled. Sorry, it's my first time. I just feel so good with you. And strangely, given the circumstances, maybe it's fate? 
She chuckled. Fine, you persuaded me. But there won't be a wedding. We'll just sign the papers. You're an amazing woman. Can I know the reason? I don't want to take out a loan for a wedding. We'll spend that money better on the baby. As you wish, Mom. Wendy was born on time, a small, fair-haired, black-eyed beauty. If Barney had any doubts about how things would turn out with Anna, when he saw their little daughter, their joint creation, all his doubts vanished. We're going to be very, very happy, he said, tenderly kissing his wife. And they were. They had a full five peaceful, happy years. It had been three years since his wife's passing, yet Barney remembered the events of that time as vividly as if they happened yesterday. Are you sure you want to go there, he asked her, pouring soup into the plates. Anna wiped her hands with a paper towel. She tossed it into the trash bin, then leaned in to kiss her daughter on the head. They're offering a good salary, and afterward, I can take a month off. Let's go to the seaside. Barney sighed. All right. It's just for a week. Even less. I'll be back by Saturday if the weather's good, the plane will bring me back. Mama, Wendy chimed in, are you going to fly on a plane? Anna smiled. Yes, sweetheart. Mama will fly on a plane. Where to? To a very faraway village with no hospital. Will you treat people there? The doctor will treat them, I'll assist as much as I can. Wow, Wendy looked at her mother in admiration, for a long time? Just five days. The daughter looked at her father. What will we do while mom's not here? Barney pretended to ponder seriously while placing the soup plates in front of his wife and daughter. We need to think, but I'm ready to hear your suggestions. Zoo, ice cream, and let's ride bumper cars, the daughter said, that's for the first day. The father nodded seriously. A good start. Anna smiled. Agreed. For some reason, Barney didn't like the idea of his wife's business trip. He understood that doctors and nurses often traveled to such remote villages, cut off from the outside world. Nothing terrible, just spending a week in a small medical outpost, providing basic medical care, prescribing tests that patients would have to do in town. Maybe Anna would give a few shots, dress a couple of wounds. Nothing she hadn't done in the city. Yet Barney still felt uneasy. Especially when he learned on the second day that communication with the village where his wife had gone was lost. There's strong wind, almost a hurricane, they told Barney, don't worry. It happens there all the time. Everything will be fine in a day or two. Indeed, the weather normalized after two days. But it turned out that the cell tower had collapsed. Moreover, the small airstrip where planes landed had been blocked. Don't worry, they told him, in three to four days, everything will be fixed. They contacted him again after five days. Barney Jones, asked a cold male voice. Barney's insides tightened. When you're addressed like that, it never ends well. Yes. Anna Jones, your wife? Yes. You need to come. As he flew in the small, rattling plane, his mind tried to process the information. During the hurricane, the house where the medics were staying was destroyed. Anna passed away. The doctor was severely injured. Several local residents also died. Most likely, she passed away quickly, the person transmitting this information to Barney said, we assume she was hit by a falling beam. She lost consciousness and didn't regain it. The doctor was also badly hurt. He remained unconscious for several days, but once the airstrip was cleared, they took him to the hospital. It seems he's not yet regained consciousness. What did you do with her body? Barney asked quietly, fighting back tears choking him. The person cleared his throat and looked at the grieving husband. It's hot weather, there's no morgue there. The local people collectively decided to bury her and the others who passed away. I need to see her grave. And now, Barney was flying in this small plane to a far-off, partially destroyed village, to see the place where his wife would forever rest. He spent only an hour there. That was enough time to walk to the small village cemetery located on a stony hill. 
The soil here is very hard, said the talkative local man appointed to accompany Barney, so, they don't dig deep. Barney shivered. He stared directly at his wife's grave. A small mound of fresh earth mixed with small stones. A simple wooden cross with her last name, initials, and the date of her passing engraved. Goodbye, my love. The woman opened her eyes. Her head hurt so much. She glanced around. She had woken up in this house twice before. The same low wooden ceiling, a small dark room, a narrow bed she was lying on. How long had passed now? Although, it probably wasn't important. Something else was crucial. To remember what happened before. The woman squinted, trying to strain her memory. She had woken up in this house before. There was a man here, he gave her water. It seemed like he wiped her lips, asked something, but she didn't have the strength to answer. Gradually, fragments began to surface in her memory, earth, mud, as if she was crawling, struggling to climb up, and before that, someone was shouting. Was she shouting? Also, a sense of suffocation, as if she was locked in a small wooden box, trying to get out. It was still completely unclear what these memories meant, but she would remember. She would remember everything. The woman squinted, attempting to recall what happened even earlier, but a throbbing pain in her temples pulsed, and she closed her eyes. Anna woke up to the sensation of cold dampness on her forehead. What was this? She opened her eyes. Finally awake. Beside her bed stood a grim, black-bearded old man. He was the one pressing the damp cloth against her forehead. Who are you? The woman asked weakly. They call me Mr., said the man. I see, the woman said quietly. She didn't remember him. And what's your name, beautiful? She swallowed. I, I don't remember. The old man sighed. That's what I thought. Seems like someone hit you on the head. Where am I? In my house. And where is that? In the woods. Mr. Butler sighed. Afraid I can't give you exact coordinates. Do you remember anything about yourself? No, the woman said weakly, nothing. I found you a week ago, in the woods. You were lying unconscious under a tree. Oh my. Yes, nodded the old man, I've been nursing you as best I can, feared you might not make it. But you seem to be improving. Thank you. Ah. Uh. You don't need to thank me. What shall we call you, though? It's not right for a person to be nameless. I don't remember my name. You can come up with one yourself. The old man seemed to think for a moment. Dorothy. Maybe Carmen, or Zara. She chuckled. Mr. Butler smiled too. Kimberly, Louise, Monica. Or maybe you have an unusual name, like Polly, or some Angela. At the mention of the last name, something sparked in her mind. Yes, let it be Angela. Didn't expect that. Well, if you like it, let it be Angela. Shall I try feeding you then? I would love to eat, very hungry. For another two weeks, the woman hardly got out of bed. A couple of times, she lost consciousness, but now she remembered everything, Mr. Butler, Angela, those strange memories about dirty soil and a wooden box. With each passing day, Angela felt better. She started sitting up, then standing, and eventually going outside. The little house stood amidst the woods, almost like in a fairy tale. Mr. Butler used to be a forest ranger. He retired long ago, a forest ranger wasn't needed anymore. His position remained vacant, and he stayed to live in the same house. How far is the nearest village from here? Asked Angela. The former forest ranger furrowed his brow. There are a few small villages around, but each is several kilometers away. So, I must have come from one of those villages. I don't know, Angela. Seems like there's some dark story connected to you. She bit her lip. Do you think there's something criminal involved? Most likely. Just think, I found you in the woods, covered in mud, head injured. You clearly didn't just trip and hit your head. 
I haven't seen any search parties here. So, you didn't get lost during a forest stroll? The woman sighed. It would be easier if I remembered something about myself. He gently took her hand. Don't worry, someday you'll remember everything. For now, your main task is to recover. She nodded. But I don't know what to do afterward, once I recover. How to live on, where to go? The old man sighed. I'll go to people, visit the neighboring villages. I won't directly ask about you, but I'll find out if anything strange has happened. Thank you. If I can somehow repay you. Mr. Butler grinned slyly. Can you cook? Angela shrugged. I don't know. Excellent, let's give it a try then. Some memories seem to remain within her. Perhaps at the level of instincts, habits. But when she took a knife and a potato, the forest ranger didn't need to show her how to peel it. The girl's hands did it all by themselves. See that? Mr. Butler said with delight, maybe you'll remember something else interesting. I hope so. You will. You'll see or hear something familiar and remember. She pondered. I hope it works. Then it's silly to keep you here. On the contrary, I should try to expose you to as many different things as possible. Angela nodded, but then she shrugged strangely, a movement noticed by the old man. Don't worry. First, I'll scout the situation. We need to ensure nobody is looking for you. And I'll tell everyone you're my granddaughter. That's clever of you. He shrugged, pleased. I used to read a lot of detective stories. The forest gets boring alone, so I learned quite a bit. Mr. Butler gestured somewhere. Angela turned and saw a cupboard standing in the corner. It was filled with books from top to bottom. Can I read them? Of course. Take what you want. As promised, Mr. Butler visited the neighboring settlements. They were still recovering from a recent disaster. Nobody paid attention to the former forest ranger. Besides the hurricane that claimed several human lives, no strange incidents were noticed. It's calm there, he said to Angela upon returning from the scouting, nobody is looking for you. Then what? Asked the woman, how did I end up here? He shrugged. I don't know if we'll ever solve this mystery. Once you recover, we'll go to the city for a stroll. Maybe you'll see something familiar there. She nodded. Okay. The first months after his wife's death, Barney hardly remembered. The only memory was heavy and awkward, as he told his daughter about it. The five-year-old girl couldn't understand for a long time which heavens her mother had gone to and why she wouldn't come back anymore. Can't she come back from there? Wendy inquired of her father, seeking answers. Unable to speak, the father shook his head. At least for Christmas or my birthday? No, Wendy, mom won't come back to us. The daughter frowned, why didn't she tell us that she was going there? At that time, his parents and older sister helped him immensely. Buffy took a month off and moved in with her younger brother, helping him cope with the loss. He couldn't even recall how his vacation began. The one he planned to spend with his wife and daughter by the sea. He couldn't remember how the days passed while he lay in bed. Sometimes, his parents, Buffy, Wendy would visit. Okay, that's enough, Barney, said his sister, I can't keep living with you all the time. We can't handle taking care of you and your child. Don't take her, replied the brother, I don't mind. Oh, come on. And are you capable of taking care of yourself and your daughter? Yes. Are you saying you have complete control of the situation? Of course. And where is your daughter now? At home, I just spoke with her. The sister raised her eyebrows expressively. He stood up, went around the apartment. Wendy. No one answered. Well, then she must have gone for a walk with our parents. Barney, Buffy approached him and gently took his hand, Wendy has been living with mom and dad for four days now. At that moment, he burst into tears. He approached his sister, hugged her, and buried his face in her shoulder. The last time he did that, he was seven, and Buffy was eleven. 
that was when he got severely injured by a nail in the yard. It will be okay, she said, gently stroking his head. It won't be, Buffy. It will, just not immediately. Barney, it can't go on like this. I understand, I'm sorry. I don't know how to pull myself together, it's not working. We're here for you, little brother. And you still have your daughter. She just lost her mother. Don't leave her without a father, too. He sighed heavily. And you'll start seeing a therapist, his sister said in a firm tone. Okay. That saved him. Not immediately, of course, but time, his loved ones, and the therapist gradually helped Barney return to a normal life. Of course, he had to think about Wendy. How could he have been so selfish? Yes, he lost his wife, became a single father. But his daughter was only five years old, she barely understood what was happening. And he left her alone for a whole month, without support, without paternal attention, without affection. Do you think she'll ever forgive me for this, he asked his sister. Of course, she loves you more than anything. Just don't leave her like that anymore. I'll never leave her. He dove headfirst into work. It helped. His strength was solely for Wendy. He tried to spend every spare minute with her. He knew he couldn't replace her mother, but he tried to be a good father at least. Barney learned to braid his daughter's hair, did lessons with her, bought the most beautiful dresses, and allowed her to choose whatever made her laugh. For example, while most parents wanted to enroll their daughters in ballet, figure skating, or singing, Barney enrolled Wendy in karate. Are you sure, he gently asked her. The daughter vigorously nodded, making her braids bounce. There will be boys there. They won't go easy on you. It'll hurt. No problem, daddy, Wendy firmly replied, I'll handle it. He sighed, I'll be worried about you. If it gets tough, I'll tell you. Barney smiled, and where did you get this bravery and seriousness from? From mom, Wendy calmly replied. When Angela finally recovered completely, Mr. Butler, as promised, took her to the city. It was a small city, only a few hundred thousand inhabitants, but the forester hoped that his charge would recognize something or someone in it. I like it here, the woman said as they sat near the fountain in the Central Park after strolling along the main streets. He nodded and looked around. Well, I usually don't like cities. And I'm not very good with people in general. But I must admit, it's quite pleasant here. How about you, Angela, did you recognize anything? She sighed heavily, not really. But I understand what things are called, pharmacies, supermarkets, skateboards, cappuccinos, and lattes. I remember it all. Mr. Butler scratched his head, all right, that's good. As for streets, buses, squares, did anything flash in your memory? Angela shrugged, no, nothing. It's as if I've never been here. She turned and looked at him with fear in her eyes. What if it doesn't work out? What if I've already seen something familiar, like my home, workplace, acquaintances, but didn't recognize them? That's what I fear the most. The old man sighed again, don't worry, Angela. We'll figure something out. We'll stay here for the night, and tomorrow, if need be, we'll go to the police. What if they're looking for me? He took her hand, let's hope not. If you don't want to, we won't go anywhere. But then there'll hardly be any chance for me to find out who I am. The old man sighed heavily once more, exactly. Okay, it's getting dark. Let's go. Where will we stay overnight? At an old friend's place of mine. Mr. Butler's friend's house was on the outskirts of the city. It was a small, cozy building surrounded by an old apple orchard. Henry, the homeowner, joyfully shouted, coming out to meet the guests. He resembled the forester, equally robust, gray-haired, and sun-tanned. Just a bit shorter and stockier. Long time no see, Brandon, said Mr. Butler. They hugged tightly, patting each other on the shoulders. This is your young ward, I understand, said Brandon. Absolutely. Angela, this is Mr. Parker, my old friend. Pleasure, said the woman, extending her hand. Likewise. 
Come in, no need to stand on the doorstep. Mr. Parker fed them a delicious dinner, at the end of which he took out a bottle of chilled apricot liqueur from the fridge. Just a little, the homeowner said, noticing his old friend's reproachful look. Oh, Brandon, Brandon. The liqueur was viscous, thick, and sweet. Angela felt a sense of relief wash over her. It was as if the tension she'd felt since the moment she first realized she couldn't remember anything about herself had dissipated. And now, it didn't seem to matter anymore. Everything will be okay, she said quietly. What, Angela, asked Mr. Parker, who hadn't heard her. Angela? Mr. Butler repeated. Yes, that's my name. She chuckled. Actually, in our tradition, Mr. Parker began to speculate, she'll be called Anna. The woman took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. It felt as though she was ready to remember something, but it didn't come. Are you all right? Mr. Butler asked her. Yes, she replied, sorry, I'll go to bed. The next day, she woke up early. The men were still asleep, and she decided to make a plan of action. Yesterday, they suggested new name options for her. Angela, Anna, Anna, she softly uttered aloud. Anna, those sounds awakened something inside her. Perhaps, that's her name? Or someone close, mother, sister, daughter. Does she have any of them? What should she do? Go to the police? What if they're looking for her? She sat in the kitchen, sipping strong herbal tea. Mr. Butler walked in. Good morning, Angela, he said. Had a good rest? Yes, it's very nice here. And you? Did you stay up late yesterday? Oh, till late. We had a great chat yesterday. I'm glad I became the reason for your meeting with your friend. The forester smiled. Meeting people can be nice. Thanks for reminding me of that. Anna smiled back, I was thinking about what to do next. Well, what did you decide? I want to take another walk around the city today. Maybe I'll remember something. If not, we'll go to the police. He nodded seriously, remember, you can always stay with me. As long as you want. She moved closer to him and took the old man's hand. Thank you, Mr. Butler. For everything you've done for me. You saved my life. And now, I guess it's time for me to live that life. Maybe someone is waiting for me. Husband, daughter, or parents. He nodded, then let's go. I don't want to trouble you. I can walk alone. No, I won't let you go alone. They set off again through the city. Anna and Mr. Butler wandered the streets, visited shopping centers, stopped by monuments, and sat on benches in parks. Let's grab a bite, Anna suggested. It's lunchtime, and it's time to rest. With pleasure, said the forester. They entered a nearby cafe. It was located on a small street and had hardly any customers. Only one man entered after them, sitting nearby. They were greeted by a smiling waitress and escorted to a round wooden table. Order for me too, Mr. Butler requested. I'm not familiar with this menu. And I've completely lost my memory, Anna grinned. She opened the menu, flipped through it. Everything seemed simple and familiar. Anna made her choice. The waitress took the order and went to the man at the nearby table. So, how are things today? I haven't remembered anything yet. But a strange feeling arises when I pass hospitals. Maybe I was recently there? Possible. But I like that I understand how everything works. I know how to take the bus, how to buy groceries. There's a chance I won't get lost in the future. Will you go to the police? She shrugged and was about to respond when an excited voice came from behind. Is that really you? Although Barney was certain that the homeless woman he and Wendy met today couldn't be his wife, doubts gnawed at him inside. He understood that he saw her for only a few seconds, and she was far away. But why did Wendy mistake this woman for her mother? In the three years since Anna's death, his daughter had never mistaken other women for her. And suddenly, today she did. 
He had already decided that the image of her mother had faded from Wendy's memory. She was only five then. But that woman resembled her greatly. Enough, he told himself, stop going crazy. You know it's simply impossible. It's nonsense, imagination, a false, silly, meaningless hope. The next day, while he was dropping off his daughter at school before work, Barney involuntarily glanced at the store they passed. No one was there. But I can go there after work. Ask if anyone saw this woman before, or maybe she'll come back there herself. No, enough. Why do I need this? In reality, he understood why. Now, he needed to find this woman at all costs. To look and make sure it was just his imagination. Otherwise, he wouldn't calm down. Barney pondered this all day. During the lunch break, he couldn't hold back and called his sister. As always, Buffy reacted calmly. Find her. Until you find her, you'll keep hoping. He sighed. Buffy, we're both adults and understand that this is impossible. Barney heard his sister chuckle over the phone. When you watch movies, you know that the events in them aren't real, right? Yes, Buffy, I understand. But you still empathize with the characters? What are you trying to say? Even if you're trying to convince yourself it's unlikely, if your brain can imagine that Anna is alive, it will keep imagining until you're certain otherwise. Do you think I should try to find this woman? Yes. There's a second option, but I like it less. Barney frowned. What is it? You didn't see your wife's body after she died? His throat tightened. Buffy, you're not suggesting that. Yes, you'll have to dig up your wife's grave to make sure she's there. Barney sat on a chair. His head spun. Strangely, he understood his sister was right. He wouldn't be at peace until he found out everything. She looked around. The man at the nearby table was staring at her as if he'd found a treasure he'd been searching for all his life. It's you, you, he repeated, his eyes welling up with tears. He appeared to be around forty. Tall, with pleasant facial features, black hair slightly touched with gray at the temples, pale green almost translucent eyes. He wore a formal business suit. The hands holding the teacup were slightly trembling. Angela felt her throat dry up. Do you, do you know me? The man nodded, placed the teacup, half of its contents now spilled on the table, and grabbed a napkin from his table, wiping away tears, before asking. You really don't remember me, Annabelle? Mr. Butler tensed his body and pulled his chair closer to Anna, as if ready to defend her. Who are you? he asked the man. I'm her husband, he replied. My husband? Anna asked weakly. The man nodded. My name is Carter. When I saw you, I couldn't believe my eyes. I sat down, watched, and thought I was going crazy. There were a couple of times I mistook other girls for you. Anna felt her heart pounding. Could this be true? Can such things happen? But then I overheard your conversation, observed you closely, and convinced myself it wasn't my imagination. Mr. Butler intervened in the conversation. If you're her husband, tell us what happened. Carter nodded. Yes, sorry, I'm completely disoriented from nerves. He leaned back in his chair, took a deep breath. At that moment, the waitress arrived. Your orders are almost ready, I'll bring them now, she said with a smile. Shall we combine the tables? Yes, that would be great, said Carter. Thank you so much, Anna said. The waitress nodded, wiped the spilled tea, and left. Carter moved to their table. The waitress returned with a tray full of food. Enjoy your meal, she said. Thank you, they all replied together. When the waitress left, Carter began to tell his story. You disappeared almost a year ago. Just went to the store and didn't come back. I searched everywhere for you. Went to the police, organizations dealing with missing persons. It was all in vain. And then, when I had lost hope, I saw you in a random cafe. Can this really happen? Tears streamed down his face again. I'm sorry, said Carter and reached for more napkins. 
What did you say my name was? Annabelle. Some acquaintances called you Anna, but I always preferred your full name. There you go, Mr. Butler exclaimed happily. You felt it was your name. Anna nodded. She smiled, though she hadn't remembered anything. She hoped that after seeing someone from her past life, her memory would immediately return. She would surely remember everything. The most important thing was that they found her. Is it just a miracle that we met you? Carter said to the forester. He nodded. Do you remember anything, he asked Anna. What happened to you during this year? She shook her head. I regained consciousness a few weeks ago. Mr. Butler found me in the woods, many kilometers from here. Carter frowned. In the woods? Yes, said the forester. She was covered in dirt, had a wound on her head, like someone had hit her. My poor girl, said Carter. I'm afraid to even imagine what happened to you during this year. The important thing is that it's all behind us, Mr. Butler said. Yes, said Anna and smiled. They spent a little more time in the café, chatting. Then Anna and Carter warmly bid farewell to the forester, and her newfound husband ordered a taxi. Home, Annabelle, you're finally going home. They drove for a while, and on the way, Carter explained, we used to live in an apartment near the city center. After you disappeared, I couldn't stay there. Initially, I waited, expecting you to return. I thought I'd come back from work, and you'd be sitting on the couch as usual, reading some novel. Did I love reading? Very much, he smiled. Then hope dwindled. I realized I couldn't stay in a place that reminded me of you. I sold the apartment, bought this little house outside the city, away from people. Where do you work? asked Anna. At the bank. I manage a department. Wow. And what do I do for work? He smiled, all the years we've been married, you haven't worked. Oh, Anna wasn't expecting that. Do we have children? No. How many years have we been married? Almost ten. Anna nodded. I have parents, brothers, and sisters, she said. He sighed heavily, as far as I know, you didn't have any brothers or sisters. Your parents died in a car accident six years ago. Anna froze. It hurt. It was strange to suffer for people she didn't even remember. But the thought that her closest family was no longer alive made her want to cry. So, you're the only one I have? He nodded and embraced her shoulders. Anna rested her head on his shoulder and fell asleep without realizing it. Wake up, darling, she heard Carter's voice. We're home. She opened her eyes, stepped out of the car, and saw a cozy white house with a red shingled roof. A well-kept garden was visible a little further away. I hope you'll like it here, said Carter. I already do, said Anna. After school, Barney dropped his daughter off at her grandparents. They hadn't seen their granddaughter for a long time and were happy to spend time with her. Stay overnight with us, Grandma Wendy suggested. And in the morning, we'll take you to school. The daughter looked at her father questioningly. He shrugged. I don't mind. What about you? Of course, I want to. And will you make pancakes for me? The question was directed to the grandmother, who laughed and nodded happily. Leaving his daughter, Barney returned home and parked the car. He slowly walked to the store where he saw the woman. He went inside. There was only the saleswoman. Good afternoon, Barney greeted her. She looked at him disinterestedly. What do you want? It was awkward to ask about something like this. But did he have other options? Have you seen a homeless woman near the store? About 35 years old, slim, with black hair below her shoulders? The saleswoman raised an eyebrow. Excuse me? Barney coughed. It was uncomfortable to ask. I need to find her. She was near your store yesterday. Did you see her? She shrugged. A lot of people come here. A lady like that didn't come into our store. This is a decent place. Thank you. 
Barney was about to leave when suddenly an idea struck him. He took out his diary and pen from his bag, wrote down his phone number on a piece of paper, and handed it to the saleswoman. Please, if you happen to see her, call me. I would be very grateful. There was a glint of interest in the saleswoman's eyes. Is she your acquaintance? He nodded. You could say that. Thanks again. Barney left the store. He had no idea who else to ask. Just in case, he walked around the nearest houses, talked to a couple of grandmothers sitting at the entrance. They hadn't seen anyone. Until it got dark, he aimlessly wandered around the area, not knowing what he was looking for. I'm unlikely to just accidentally stumble upon this woman, thought Barney. Twice in a row is too much. He came home, had sandwiches for dinner, and took a shower. Standing under the hot water, Barney made a final decision. He was about to go to bed when the phone rang. Looking for your ghost, without even saying hello, his sister asked. Good evening to you too, Barney replied. Good. So? No. I mean, yes, I was looking. Ran around the neighborhood all evening. Nothing. There was a momentary pause, then Buffy asked, what are you going to do next? Tomorrow, I'll call, find out how to get to that damned village. Okay. I knew you'd do that. Thanks. For what, his sister was surprised. For not calling me crazy, for believing, for supporting. There was an audible, concerned sigh from Buffy. You're my brother. How could I act otherwise? And you know what? What? Buy two tickets. I'll fly with you. When Anna woke up, it took her a few minutes to understand where she was. A spacious, bright room, a large double bed with white bedding. Good morning, darling, she heard Carter's voice. He came into the room holding a plastic foldable breakfast table. There was a cup of coffee, an omelet on a plate, and a ham and cheese sandwich. What a beauty, said Anna and smiled. I hope everything tastes good. Her husband sat down next to her. How did you sleep? Very well, and you? Superbly. How else can you sleep when yesterday was the happiest day of my life? He leaned over and kissed her on the temple. Eat before it gets cold, he said. Anna didn't object. Everything looked appetizing. Very delicious, she said. I thought if I were a housewife, I'd be the one making breakfasts. He laughed. Well, that used to be the case. But I figured it wouldn't be very polite to wake you up today and make you stand at the stove. Anna smiled. I really appreciate that. Hopefully, I'll adapt quickly and start remembering everything. He nodded. No memories yet? She shook her head sadly. It's okay. Rest. Carter got up. Where are you going? Anna asked, surprised. It's time for me to go to work. You settle in for now. I almost regret selling the old apartment. Maybe you would have remembered everything faster there. But on the other hand, it's quiet and peaceful here, no one will disturb us. Do you need anything? I need clothes, Anna confessed shyly. I have almost nothing. It's all in the wardrobe. See what you need to buy. Make a list. Tomorrow, I'll go to the city and get everything. I can go myself. He shook his head. No need, I'll bring everything you want. Besides, you have no way to go into the city. Buses don't come here, and you don't know how to drive. Oh, that's right, Anna said disappointedly. Don't be upset. Carter sat on the bed and kissed her on the cheek again. It's hard to leave you, but work won't wait. Rest. After everything you've been through, you deserve it. Her husband left. Anna finished her breakfast unhurriedly, stood up, and went to take a shower. She decided to explore the house. It was beautiful and clean. Logically, she understood she hadn't lived here with Carter. Therefore, she shouldn't have remembered this place. But she was sorry that new memories hadn't appeared yet. 
She was generally upset that she didn't remember her husband at all. After all that had happened, she hadn't made any progress toward regaining her memory. Just one familiar word, her name, Anna. Annabelle. The latter seemed alien to her. Was that what her husband called her? Why didn't she remember him if they had been together for almost ten years? All right, enough moping, she told herself aloud. I'm home. The first thing is to get dressed. She checked the wardrobe. There were neat, ironed dresses. Beautiful, long, and seemingly expensive. Did I really wear these at home? Anna mused. Not very practical. She searched through the clothes for something comfortable. Nothing. Only beautiful dresses, silk blouses, long satin skirts. Anna opened a chest where she expected to find casual clothes. There were only lingerie, lace, silk, delicate translucent slips, and ropes. Well, this seems the most acceptable, Anna said, taking out a short, black, smooth top and matching shorts. In the bathroom, she found a new toothbrush, but there were no women's shampoos. There was only one sponge, and the shower gel was also masculine. Well, it would be strange to keep a year's worth of hygiene items for a missing wife, Anna reasoned. Especially right in the bathroom. She found a notepad and a pen and started writing a list, comfortable home clothes, toiletries, cosmetics. Did she use cosmetics and perfumes? If yes, what kind? Maybe her husband knew, after all, they were married for ten years. She also needed to learn more about herself. It's a shame she doesn't have relatives, but perhaps there are some friends, acquaintances. Maybe there are distant relatives, uncles, aunts, grandmothers, and grandfathers. Now let's check the kitchen, Anna said. Talking to herself made it easier. When she was silent, she felt like she was alone in a stranger's house. Oh, his kitchen, I mean, our kitchen, Anna corrected herself. It's nice. Indeed, everything was well-equipped, a dishwasher, a modern built-in stove, a food processor, a set of professional knives, shiny frying pans, and pots. Was I that good of a housewife that I knew how to use all this? She managed to figure out the dishwasher but was puzzled by the food processor. After inspecting the fridge, she added groceries to her list. Sandwiches will do for lunch. But for dinner, I probably need to cook something. What did Carter say? Does she like to read? She believed she did. Moreover, she discovered a huge bookcase in the living room. There were classics, detective stories, science fiction. A lot of everything. Anna perused the covers of some authors and works, she remembered reading, The Little Prince, for sure. White Fang, something vaguely familiar. Pride and Prejudice, it seems there's also a movie based on that. She sat by the bookcase until lunch, then went to the kitchen and had sandwiches. I wonder why my memory works so selectively. Now Anna wasn't just talking to herself. In the living room, there was a small aquarium where a school of golden fish swam, and she addressed her words to them. Look, I remember a lot. How to make sandwiches. How to use the dishwasher. I remember the face of the actor who starred in the series based on this book. But I don't remember my husband. Why? The fish remained silent, looking at her with their big round eyes. Don't know? I don't know either. Sighing, she took another book. Maybe read something else? Or watch. She stepped away from the bookcase and continued exploring the room. The TV stood on a low cabinet with several shelves. Anna noticed a DVD player on the top shelf immediately. She remembered what it was called and its purpose. If there's a player, there must be discs for it, Anna said to the fish, who remained silent. She opened the doors covering the bottom shelf of the cabinet. Indeed, there were two stacks of boxes containing discs. Anna went through them one by one. Almost all the titles were unfamiliar to her. Seems like I remember books better, she said sadly. Anna was about to put all the discs back when the large letters on the last box caught her attention. A short word, Hitchcock. The cover displayed a black and white photo of a bald, plump, slyly smiling man. 
Hitchcock, Anna repeated thoughtfully. Suddenly, something sparked in her mind. She saw herself sitting on the floor on a thick, soft rug. Leaning against the couch, she watched a black and white movie on the big TV screen somewhere far in front of her. Hitchcock, Anna repeated again and closed her eyes tighter. It worked. She saw a missing detail. Sitting next to her on the floor near the couch was a guy, young, handsome, with brown hair and blue eyes. He looked at Anna tenderly, then leaned in and kissed her. Anna opened her eyes. It wasn't Carter. That guy looked nothing like her husband. Who is he? I could have been dating him before Carter, she said to the fish, but I've been with him for ten years. What if she was cheating on her husband? The thought disgusted her. Or was I with him in that year when I disappeared? Then why don't I remember anything? That was all. No matter how long Anna sat on the floor afterward, how much she looked at the disc cover, or repeated the magic word, she didn't see anything more. It's time to prepare dinner, she said to herself and the fish. Suddenly, she realized that no one had fed the fish all day. She found a box with an unfamiliar mix near the aquarium. It's probably not something different, she said to the fish and generously sprinkled her listeners. Judging by how eagerly they devoured the food, it was dinner time. After feeding the fish, Anna went to prepare food for herself and Carter. She wasn't in the mood for culinary extravagance, so she baked chicken breast and made mashed potatoes. She thought for a moment and added a vegetable salad to the dinner. The newly minted hostess finished just in time. The key turned in the lock, and Carter appeared at the doorstep. Hello, dear, he said. Hello, Anna replied without turning. How was your day? It was interesting. Anna turned and saw that Carter had a huge bouquet of roses and a cake in one hand, and a bottle of champagne in the other. He handed the flowers to his wife. Thank you, Anna said. I thought a little celebration wouldn't hurt today. Anna smiled, suddenly feeling warm and good inside. She realized she was finally safe. No one was chasing her, she hadn't fallen victim to criminal conflicts. She was home with someone who loved and cared for her. What are you thinking about? She shrugged. Just about how good it is to be home. Carter smiled. I'm very glad. He approached and hugged her. At last, you're home, my dear. You can't imagine how long I've been waiting for you. Let's have dinner. And celebrate your wonderful return. And celebrate my wonderful return. Carter laughed and, with a skillful move, popped open the champagne. There was a pop Anna was startled at first, then laughed. I'm glad to see you smile, her husband said. Why do these planes fly so rarely? Buffy said disapprovingly. They were standing, waiting for boarding. Probably not as many people there as in Milan or New York, Barney replied in a similar tone to his sister. She rolled her eyes. You know I'm not that dumb. I'm just chatting to distract myself. I understand. I'm nervous too. I can't imagine. She placed her hand on his shoulder and gave a slight squeeze. But you know it's better than uncertainty. Barney nodded. You're right. Unfortunately, when you're teaching me about life, you're mostly right. Buffy snorted. Nice to know that by 35 it's finally sunken for you. There's hope you're not hopeless. Get lost, the older brother replied good naturedly. On the plane, he said to his sister, We don't have any plan, do we? We do, Buffy calmly replied. Go to the cemetery? Well, yes. And then? She shrugged. We'll play it by ear. Dig up my wife's grave in front of everyone? Well, let's wait until there are fewer people around. Very funny, Buffy. She snorted. If there's no other way, we'll resort to that. Barney smiled. It's odd. I should theoretically be terrified, yet here I am laughing. Because soon you'll be rid of your scariest burden, the unknown. Barney nodded. You're right. When they left the small airfield, Barney was surprised. 
Apparently, the village had been rebuilt over the past three years. All the houses looked sturdy and new. Do you remember where the cemetery is? Of course. For some time, they walked along a long, almost empty street. You know, Buffy said thoughtfully, breaking the silence, it would have been nice here. Barney sighed, yes, if not for certain circumstances. But who knows how they will change by the end of the day. Is there anything in this life that can truly scare or upset you? Buffy shrugged, live like I have, little brother, and you'll stop being scared and surprised. You're only four years older than me. So, chatting and joking, distracting themselves from gloomy thoughts, they reached the cemetery. Well, here we are, Barney said quietly. Buffy nodded and looked around, it's beautiful here, quiet, with a forest nearby. The younger brother sighed, don't romanticize, it's sickening. Buffy raised her eyebrows, I'm quite serious. Remember where to go? When Barney was here for the first time, he was too shocked to understand where they were taking him. But it turned out he remembered everything. It was as if his feet were leading him to the right grave. Here, he said. The grave was located at the very edge of the cemetery. However, it could only be conditionally called the edge, as there were no more graves beyond it. The cemetery wasn't separated from the forest by a fence or wall. Anna Jones, Buffy read from the crooked and blackened wooden cross. Barney nodded, so, what do we do next? Buffy sighed, about to speak, when footsteps behind them interrupted. The brother and sister turned sharply. A man in his fifties was walking towards them, small, with overgrown gray, prickly stubble. Despite the warm weather, he wore thick winter pants, rubber boots, and an old knitted sweater. All his clothes looked very old. They seemed to have been washed for the last time about five years ago. Good day, unexpectedly chirped Buffy in a gentle and affectionate voice to the unkempt man. Barney looked at her, surprised. Where's this kindness coming from? The man nodded, good day. Who are you? He asked in a hoarse, somewhat drunk voice. Buffy smiled broadly, are you the guard? The man looked at her suspiciously, how do you know? You reacted so vigilantly and promptly to our appearance. It wasn't hard to guess. She continued to smile, and the man seemed confused. He put his hands in his trouser pockets and tried to look more businesslike. I'm Donald. Yes, I'm the local guard. Nice to meet you, Buffy. Barney was even more surprised. His sister's voice was tender, as if she were flirting with Donald. At the end of the sentence, she extended her hand, which Donald, equally surprised as Barney, cautiously shook. How long have you been working here? Buffy inquired. Donald shrugged, about ten years or, no, wait. He withdrew his hands from his pockets and began to count complex calculations on his fingers. Already twelve years, the man said with a touch of sadness. Donald, Buffy gently addressed him, you probably know everyone here? She looked into his eyes meaningfully, and Donald finally relented. Well, not everyone, Donald replied with a necessary modesty, but most, especially, the recent deceased. Buffy nodded, and about the girl buried here, can you tell us? She nodded towards Anna's grave. The seemingly simple question had an unexpected effect on Donald. He swallowed, crossed himself, and looked at Buffy fearfully. So, you also know about her? What are you talking about? Barney asked, but his sister gave him a sideways glance. Well, we know some things, Buffy evasively said, but I think you'll tell us everything in detail. Donald sighed heavily. Yes, I've told the whole village about it, but no one believed me. They said I was going crazy because of my age. Buffy approached and gently patted the guard on the shoulder. Now, you're not that old, she said almost tenderly, and besides, we believe you. Maybe you can guide us to your place, and you'll tell us everything. Donald nodded, turned around, and slowly, with slightly stumbling steps, walked away. Buffy and Barney followed him. The guard led them to a small building, inside which were only an old stove, a table, two benches, and a low wooden bed in the corner, covered with a dirty checkered blanket. Sorry, the guard suddenly said, it's not tidy here. 
I wasn't expecting guests. It's okay, said Buffy, sitting down on the bench, just tell us. The guard pulled out a half-empty bottle of vodka from somewhere and offered it to the guests. They politely declined. With your permission, I'll have a little drink, he said. He poured himself some bracing liquid into a murky glass, drank it, sniffed his sleeve, and began his story. The grave you're asking about appeared here three years ago. The doctors flew into the village back then. A doctor and a nurse. Well, a routine thing. Only that time they were unlucky. We had a strong hurricane just then. Old folks say there hadn't been such a thing in a hundred years. The guard sighed, apparently recalling events from three years ago. He poured himself more vodka, looked thoughtfully at the glass, but didn't drink yet. Then the whole village was almost destroyed. Several people died, many were injured. And everyone lost contact. And the airfield wasn't working. And there was no way to get here except by air. Donald took the glass in his hand, almost brought it to his lips, but for some reason, changed his mind and placed it back on the table. At that time, it was terribly hot. We had to hurriedly bury people. So, did you determine the fact of death yourselves? Buffy asked. The guard shrugged. What's there to determine? If they don't move or breathe, they're ready. Suddenly, Barney's heart started racing very fast. He took a slow, deep breath. I need to pull myself together, it's not the time to panic. We buried them all, the guard continued, and then everything happened a few days later. What happened? Buffy asked. The guard looked grimly at her. I was doing my rounds at night. It was already dark, just the moon shining. I was walking, not bothering anyone. Suddenly, I saw something moving near one of the new graves. At first, I didn't understand. I thought maybe it was an animal or one of the villagers who got drunk and came here. I decided to approach to help if it was someone I knew, but then I saw it was the deceased. Barney felt like he couldn't breathe. At that moment, his sister squeezed his hand hard, almost to the point of pain, and it helped him regain some composure. What deceased? Buffy calmly asked. Yes, the nurse who arrived and died during the hurricane. Did you see her? Yes, she crawled out from under the ground where her grave with a cross was. Well, of course, it was difficult to see in the darkness, but it was clear it was her. Who else could come out of a grave? And what did you do? The guard sighed, took the glass in his hand, and with one determined motion, downed its contents. Of course, what do you think? I ran away as far as I could from there. Where to? What protects from the dead? The church. It's in the opposite end of the village. I ran, didn't even stop once. I sat there until dawn. The sister nodded and bit her lip, contemplating something. Did you tell anyone about what you saw? The guard sighed sadly, I did, but no one believed me. They asked me to take them to the cemetery, to verify. But people just waved me off, said, go away, old drunk, we don't need you now. We need to rebuild the village, people have nowhere to live, and here you are with your tales about the dead. Barney decided to ask, when you returned to the cemetery, did you see anything unusual there? The guard's eyes glinted, yes. The earth was disturbed near the grave, as if someone crawled out, and the tracks led into the forest. But in the morning, a heavy downpour washed it all away as if nothing had happened. No one else crawled out from there? Buffy asked. No, everything was calm. I see. Do you have a shovel here? Donald looked frightened at the woman. God be with you. What are you planning? Buffy stood up. Bring a shovel, if there are two, then two. Let's go and check. Donald wanted to object, but changed his mind for some reason. Apparently, he also had some doubts that he wanted to resolve once and for all. He poured himself another shot of vodka. Then he stood up and went to get the shovels. He kept one for himself and handed the other to Barney. Together, the three of them walked towards the familiar grave. 
The ground here is loose, commented the guard as they started digging, but only on the surface, a very thin layer, and then it's as hard as a rock. That's why our deceased are buried shallow. We thought of moving the whole cemetery elsewhere, but didn't find a suitable place. They didn't dig for long. Soon, the wooden lid of the coffin appeared. It looked strange, as if it had shifted significantly. The guard crossed himself. Why are the boards so decayed? Buffy asked, it's as if this coffin is a hundred years old. That's because it was a rushed burial, explained Donald, there were no good boards to take from. They made them from whatever they found in the village. Some were almost rotten. That explains a lot, she noted. I'm scared, confessed the guard, I won't go any further, disturbing the dead. Buffy took the shovel from him. Together with her brother, they spread the remaining earth. The boards of the coffin were almost decayed, and it was clear there were no human remains in the grave. The guard crossed himself and started whispering a prayer. Buffy turned to her brother. Well, did we make the trip for nothing? He nodded, yes, many things became clearer. But still unclear where to look for her. Months passed. Anna had gotten used to her life with her husband. It seemed like she had always lived this way. In the morning, she woke up slightly earlier than Carter, made him breakfast, saw him off to work. During the day, she took care of the house, read, watched movies, fed the fish, worked in the garden, and relaxed there with a book. In the evenings, she and her husband had dinner together. They spent the weekends together, usually at home. So the days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months. Most of the time, she felt good. She didn't want to go to the city almost at all. Everything she needed, Carter brought her himself. They only had one neighbor, an old lady, whom Anna never spoke to. You know, she once said to her husband, we live like hermits. But you're okay, going to work, and I feel like I'm separated from the rest of the world. At that moment, they were lying in the bedroom watching a movie. Anna lay with her head on his chest, but after her words, Carter lifted himself up and looked attentively at his wife. Does it bother you? he asked. She smiled, no, everything's fine. It just seems strange to me that I haven't gone anywhere. It's been ten months since I came back, and I haven't left here even once. Carter coughed strangely, sorry, he suddenly said, I should have told you about this earlier. Anna frowned, about what? He pursed his lips but didn't say anything. Anna sat up on the bed and looked at him intently. I don't like it, she insisted. He sighed, I didn't tell you about this, and you probably don't remember it yourself. Remember what? Sometime before you disappeared, you told me someone was watching you. She felt a knot in her stomach, who was watching? He shrugged, you weren't sure, just suspected. You mentioned seeing a man several times, tall, all in black, cap, sunglasses. You couldn't see his face. Anna shuddered, did I talk to him? As far as I know, no. I suggested going to the police, you laughed. You said maybe it was just your imagination, and then you disappeared. They were silent for a few minutes before Anna asked, so, you don't want me to leave the house because of this? He nodded, we never figured out what happened to you. I'm even afraid to think about what they did to you this past year. Your captors might be influential people. That's why I don't want to involve the police. Anna nodded, I don't want either. Especially now that I'm here with you. Her husband hugged her tightly and continued, since you don't remember anything, I fear those memories might be very dreadful. I don't know how you managed to escape from that person. And it's good that the forest ranger found you first. I'm afraid your captors might be powerful people. That's why I don't want to go to the police. Anna nodded, reassured by the explanation. Of course, sometimes it was unbearable to stay at home. Then, contrary to the promise she made to her husband, she tried to remember the past. It seemed that Anna wouldn't be at peace until she remembered everything that happened to her, even if it was something terrible. But the memories didn't return. No matter how hard she tried, how much she strained her memory, nothing. It had been over a year since she returned to her husband when she had a dream. 
Anna dreamed she was sitting on a bench in a large park, it was hot outside, even in her dream, she could feel the heat. She wore a short summer dress, white with small black dots. She lazily fanned herself with a child's drawing album. Looking ahead, Anna saw a fountain. A huge stone bowl was filled with cool water. In the center of the bowl stood a stone lion on its hind legs, a powerful column of water gushed from its mouth high into the air. The pedestal on which the lion stood was decorated with a pattern of small fish carved on the stone. A little girl sat at the edge of the stone basin. She looked about four to five years old. Her brown hair was tied up in two high ponytails, and her big black eyes were staring directly at Anna. The girl laughed, dipping her hand into the fountain. Wendy. Be careful, Anna called out to her, don't fall. I won't fall, mommy, the girl replied. Anna turned her head slightly and saw a man approaching her. He had three ice cream cones in his hands. He, too, was smiling and looking at the little girl. As the man came closer, Anna realized she recognized him. He was the guy from her previous memory, the one she was kissing while sitting on the floor near the couch in front of the TV. Only now, he looked a bit older. It's you, Anna said, and then she woke up. She opened her eyes. Her husband was peacefully sleeping beside her. The person from her dream definitely wasn't Carter. He had a completely different face and eyes. So, who was he? Maybe it was just a coincidence. But the first memory of him near the couch, she didn't dream that. Anna distinctly remembers that she wasn't sleeping then. And who was that little girl? Wendy, Wendy. The name seemed familiar, but no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't recall anything else. Sometimes, Anna felt like something was wrong. That she hadn't been a homemaker all her life. That she didn't want to wear those wide silk dresses, but wanted to wear simple, comfortable, wide, sporty pants. And she absolutely didn't know Carter, he was a stranger to her. No, her husband had always been gentle, caring, and affectionate. He tried to anticipate all her desires. Worked so Anna lacked for nothing. He protected her. On weekends, he made breakfast in bed. He bought everything she asked for without a second thought. But sometimes she noticed a strange expression in his eyes when he thought Anna wasn't looking. It was as if her husband froze and looked into the distance, into his own memories. Several times she heard him talking to himself, but she couldn't make out anything. Once she heard him say, Annabelle, but that was just her name, although she wasn't used to it. She asked the neighbor, the only person she interacted with besides her husband, to call her Anna. She tried it with Carter too, but he was adamant. Sorry, but I don't like the name Anna, he firmly said, I've always called you Annabelle. She accepted it. Let him call her what he wanted. Sometimes Anna was plagued by vague suspicions. She couldn't find a single photo with her husband, not even their wedding photo. He didn't have many pictures overall. In some of them, she recognized Carter as a child. There were other men and women she didn't know, but she wasn't in any of those pictures. She wanted to ask, but something always held her back. It also surprised her that she had no relatives or friends. You never told me about your extended family, her husband replied to her query. Please, anything, the woman pleaded. Second cousins, grandparents, aunts, or uncles. Carter pursed his lips and shrugged, I'm sorry, dear, I know nothing about them. And friends. I must have had friends. He sighed, you weren't very social. As far as I know, you didn't have close friends. No one asked about you after you disappeared. I see, said Anna. What kind of person was she if she didn't interact with anyone besides her husband? Was she that closed off? Now Anna craved interaction. She wanted companions, friends, to visit or invite them over. But in the current situation, it was impossible. She hardly ever left the house. And while sitting within four walls, making friends seemed challenging. With time, Anna started sinking into a strange, subdued state. She didn't want to do anything, just sleep. After Carter left for work, she'd lie in bed and could sleep through until evening. 
When her husband first returned to find the house dark, no lights on despite the darkness, nothing prepared in the kitchen, and his wife in bed, he got seriously worried. Darling, what's wrong with you? Are you sick? He touched her forehead. It was as cold as ice. No, Anna softly said, I just don't want anything. Each passing day made it worse for her. Finally, Carter realized it couldn't continue like this. We're moving, he said one evening after work. Why, the wife asked indifferently. I've been offered a new job in another city. Far from here. But most importantly, it's a big city. And since it's far away, I think no one will look for you there. Anna looked at him skeptically. Are you saying I'll be able to leave the house there? He nodded happily. It's my fault. No matter how good it is here, I see how you're languishing from loneliness. In another city, we'll start a new life. Just you and me. Anna liked the new city. It was located further south, much bigger and brighter. And they didn't live in a countryside house, but in an apartment in a new neighborhood. Do you like it? Her husband asked when they moved in. Yes, very much, Anna happily replied. She did feel better, as if something good was about to happen soon. On the very first day, as soon as her husband went to work, she dressed and went out into the city. There didn't seem to be anything here that she hadn't seen in her previous place of residence. Streets, shopping centers, parks, stores. Yet, everything here felt brighter and more familiar. She wandered for a long time, almost until evening. No new memories surfaced, but her mood improved nonetheless. How was your day? Her husband asked that evening. Great, Anna smiled, I really like it here. I'm glad, dear. The next day, Anna intended to unpack their things. Everything needed to be unpacked, cleaned, groceries bought, but her energy lasted only a couple of hours. Then she grabbed her bag and started wandering the streets. Anna didn't have a specific goal, but it felt like she would find something familiar, something she belonged to in this city. Anna strolled down the street, examining the houses. Unaware, she accidentally bumped into an elderly woman. Startled, the woman dropped her grocery bag, oranges scattering across the pavement. Oh, sorry, said Anna. She quickly bent down to pick up the items. It's okay, the old lady said kindly, it's my fault. Anna smiled. No, I was looking around instead of watching my step. Well, I was also lost in thought, the old lady said. Anna collected everything, stood up, and handed the bag back to the old lady, who looked at her intently. Anna, is it you? What? The old lady smiled. Don't you recognize me? Anna felt embarrassed. I'm sorry, no. Well, no worries. There are many of us, you can't remember everyone. Excuse me, where did we meet? The old lady looked surprised. Why, at your hospital, two years ago. You took care of me back then. Thank you so much. The best nurse in the ward. I still remember you with kind words. Anna shook her head. I'm sorry, you must have mistaken me for someone else. What? No, I couldn't have mistaken you. Mom, are you coming? The old lady looked back, and so did Anna. A man was waving from a parked car. Coming, Zach, said the woman. Anna stared at her face but couldn't remember this woman at all. Thank you again and, goodbye, said the old lady as she got into the car with her son. Anna stood in the middle of the sidewalk. What was that? She never worked, especially as a nurse, not two years ago. At that time, she wasn't even abducted, she was living peacefully with her husband. She was walking home, and in her mind, there were flashes. No, not memories. More like fragments, scenes. There she was, giving someone an injection, setting up IVs, dressing wounds, filling in some journals. This can't be, Anna whispered quietly to herself when she arrived home. She needed to calm down. She glanced at the clock. Her husband would be coming home from work soon. Anna quickly prepared dinner and waited for him. 
After the meal, as they sat in front of the TV, deciding what to watch in the evening, Anna cautiously asked. Carter, have I ever worked as a nurse? He raised his eyebrows in surprise. Of course not. Where are these strange fantasies coming from? Anna shrugged. I don't know. Today, images of needles, IVs kept flashing in my mind. You've probably been watching too many movies, her husband sharply cut her off. She looked at him, surprised. Carter looked so angry and concerned for the first time. The main thing, he said, looking her straight in the eyes, remember, you should only listen to me. I take care of you. I do everything for you. I understand, Anna whispered softly, frightened by his intensity. Good. You're my wife, he said firmly, and you'll always be with me. The tone of his voice and the strange look in his eyes made her throat dry up. The next morning, as soon as her husband left for work, Anna began to unpack their belongings. She had hardly slept all night, going through everything that had happened to her in over two years since returning home. It was as if her eyes had opened. How could she have not noticed these things before? The absence of shared photographs, the assertion that she had no relatives or friends, the desire to keep her locked up. Now she decided to sort through everything, including items she had never touched before. Her husband's personal belongings. They had an unspoken agreement not to intrude into each other's personal things. But Anna understood that if she didn't do this, she wouldn't uncover the truth. Finally, she found a gray folder with documents. She hesitated. There was a choice. If she didn't open it now, she could continue to live as before, in comfort, surrounded by the warmth and care of a loving husband. But if she did open it, she couldn't predict what would happen next. What secrets she would discover. And most importantly, what she would do with that information afterward. Okay, Anna said to herself, here goes. The information in the folder was enough for her to piece together the full picture. Carter indeed had a wife. Her name was Annabelle. And they got married about ten years ago. There was a wedding photograph in the folder, where a dark-haired girl in a white dress stood embracing a young Carter in a suit. Further, there were some hospital records. Reading them, Anna realized that Carter's wife had been in an accident three years ago and died. He's insane. She started remembering their first meeting. They were at a cafe with Mr. Butler, discussing details of her life. About her memory loss, about searching for relatives. And Carter was sitting there, listening to everything. That's probably when everything fell into place. Did Carter decide that I'm his deceased wife, Anna whispered softly, or does he understand that I'm not really his Annabelle, but he's deceiving himself? She recalled how he sometimes looked at her. How he talked to himself. How he insisted that she used a certain perfume, wore specific clothes. He wanted me to resemble her. Anna was frightened. For over two years, she had been living with a sick person, a madman. And perhaps, she had a family, relatives searching for her, parents, a husband, children, unaware of where she was and what had happened to her. And she was pretending to be someone's long-dead wife. So, the person who's been chasing me, he made it all up too. Another trick to keep me close and move here. When he realized I couldn't stay home anymore, he moved me farther away. So, he feared I might see someone from my family there, but I feel like I never lived in that city. I lived, most likely, in this one. Anna jumped up and checked the time. It was already evening. Her husband would be coming home soon. She needed to pack. She stood up and was about to walk into the room to get her suitcase when she heard the key turning in the lock. Darling, I'm home, she heard Carter's voice. Anna looked at the floor. The documents were scattered in a fan shape. Her husband would come in and see them. He would understand that Anna knew everything, and it was uncertain how he would react. She walked out of the room, closing the door behind her. You're back already, she asked to buy some time. Carter looked at her in surprise. As usual. What's for dinner? Anna struggled to smile. First, wash your hands. Everything will be ready soon. 
He went to the bathroom, and Anna slowly and carefully walked toward the front door, silently opened it, stepped out, closed it, and ran down the stairs. Barney and Buffy were sitting in the kitchen. Wendy was in her room, drawing. Coffee? Barney asked. Sure. How about instant coffee? Looks like I'm vandalizing with you, protested Buffy, can't you make coffee for your sister? I knew you'd bring that up for a long time. Of course. Barney took out the coffee pot and a jar of coffee. He turned on the gas. What are we going to do now? Buffy asked. Barney sighed, search. Now it's clear that this homeless woman was Anna. Yes, indeed. But if it's Anna, why did she run away? Barney sighed. He had been pondering that too. I don't know. I've been wondering where she was all these three years. Why didn't she come back to us with Wendy? And how did she get from there to here? Well, certainly not through the village or the local airport. You think so? But the locals would have noticed that the nurse who was buried a few days ago is now climbing out of her grave and planning to fly away, Buffy reasoned. Barney poured coffee into cups. Yeah, I don't understand anything. But, I guess, we need to look for her here. Shall we go around the neighborhood again, aimlessly wandering the city, hoping to accidentally bump into Anna? What else can we do? The brother and sister fell into thought. Maybe, Buffy suggested, we should look for her in places that mean something to her. That's a good idea. One moment. The sister left the kitchen, and there was the sound of her talking to Wendy. A minute later, Buffy returned with a notepad and a pen. Write, she demanded, handing them to her brother. What to write? Write down the places Anna might have gone to. And what are we going to do with this list? We'll check them. We'll take her photo and ask people about her. Maybe someone saw her there. You're a genius, said Barney. But someone in our family has to be a genius. The next few months blended into one. Anna only remembered the first day well. The day she escaped from her fake husband. She ran through the streets as fast as she probably had never run in her life. It was impossible to predict how soon Carter would realize she wasn't in the apartment. And how quickly he would chase after her. So Anna tried to run as far as she could. The rare passers-by looked at her with surprise, but Anna didn't care. The main thing was to run. She tried to turn from the broad central streets into small alleys, darting through courtyards. Finally, her strength gave out, and she stopped. Where am I? It was some kind of playground. Anna looked around. She had definitely gone far from the familiar area. It was getting dark. Luckily, it was warm outside. Hey, why the long face? Anna turned around. Sitting under the children's mushroom installation on the edge of the sandbox was a woman, about 50 years old. Despite it being summer, she wore a jacket, pants, and warm boots. The clothes and shoes looked worn out but mostly clean. The woman had kind, blue eyes framed by a circle of wrinkles and short gray hair. Yeah. I, Anna said, ran away from my husband. The stranger made an interested sound. He was beating you? No, he was deceiving me. The stranger chuckled. Such a deceit that's unforgivable? Yes, the kind that makes it scary to return home. He turned out to be someone other than who I thought he was all these years. The woman approached her and sat beside her. I understand. Do you have somewhere to go? Anna shook her head. No, nowhere. I don't know where to spend the night. The stranger sighed, then offered, come with me. I can't promise a five-star hotel, but we'll find something to eat and a place to sleep. Anna was surprised, but you don't know me at all. The woman smiled, well, you don't know me either. I'm Rose, by the way. Anna. Well, now we're acquainted. Rose stood up. Let's go. Anna thought there were no other options and obediently followed the stranger. Where are we going, she asked. I don't have an apartment or a house, the woman replied. 
but not far from here, I know a warm place. They walked for about twenty minutes until they reached an old abandoned house. Is this it? Anna asked in surprise. Yes, Rose replied calmly, as if it were a hotel. They went inside. In the semi-darkness, Anna saw people sleeping right on the floor. Rose confidently led her past them. They climbed the stairs with half-destroyed railings and reached the second floor. You can lie down here, Rose said. She pointed to a mattress in the corner, covered with several blankets. Anna was horrified to think that many people had probably slept on it, but she already felt overwhelming tiredness, and there were no other options. Lie down, don't be afraid, no one will bite you there. It made Anna feel even worse, but it was better than being in bed with the insane Carter. Anna took a deep breath to calm herself and lay down. To her surprise, there were hardly any unfamiliar smells from the bed. It just faintly smelled of a campfire. You need to get some sleep, Rose said. Try to think of something good before you sleep. Think that tomorrow will be a new day. Anna wrapped herself in the blanket and tried to imagine that. Overall, she could say that everything was fine. She had finally learned part of the truth. She had untangled the web of lies she had lived in for the past few years. You could say, she whispered, that today was a good day. And as for tomorrow, I'll think about it tomorrow. She fell asleep quickly, and once again, she had a dream. She stood in a small room lined with metal lockers along the wall. Anna looked at herself in the mirror. She tied her hair up in a high ponytail. She wore a white surgical suit, trousers, and a blouse. Anna stepped out, walked along a long corridor, and entered a room. There she saw the familiar old woman. The one she had met recently on the street. The old woman was wearing a housecoat and slippers. She smiled and addressed Anna. Good day, Anna. Hello, Mrs. Wright, Anna said, how are you feeling today? Great, Anna. Are you going to set up the four now? In half an hour, Mrs. Wright. Okay, dear. In the morning, Anna woke up and for a while tried to figure out where she was. Then she remembered the dream. She started to convince herself that these dreams were not just dreams. Some things became clearer. Now she knows she used to work as a nurse, but she can't know where that hospital is. She can't possibly go to all the clinics in the city, peeking into each department to ask if they remember her. Good morning, beautiful, she heard Rose's voice. Anna looked up and saw that her acquaintance from yesterday was already up, cheerfully rolling up the makeshift bed. Good morning, Anna replied. How did you sleep? Good. Rose chuckled, that's news. Usually, people from homes take a while to get used to it. Anna shrugged, I'm stronger than I look. The woman looked at her with interest. I think so too. Let's go have breakfast. Breakfast? Anna was embarrassed. She didn't have any money with her. It seems her new acquaintance guessed that. Don't worry, today's on me. She shook her jacket, and coins jingled in the pocket. Thank you, Anna said timidly. Next time, you'll pay, and I'll teach you how to earn it. Okay. They descended from the second floor. Anna thought they were the first ones up, but there was no one downstairs. I gave you a chance to sleep, Rose said, consider today our day off, but everyone else gets up early here. The women left the house and walked down the street until they bumped into a small kiosk. Hello, Teresa, Rose shouted somewhere into the depths of the small, dimly lit window, how's life? Quietly moving along, a voice replied, and how are you doing? Fine, everyone's alive. Get two coffees and two sausage rolls for these two beautiful ladies. I'll do it right away, the invisible Teresa replied cheerfully. Rose took out change, counted it, and handed it to the saleswoman. I owe you a dollar. Look, you'll become a millionaire at this rate, with all that you owe me. Rose chuckled, stop joking and feed us quickly. Our stomachs are growling. It'll be ready in a moment. A minute later, Rose and Anna were sitting at a wobbly plastic table with uncomfortable, hard chairs, having breakfast. 
Perhaps Anna was very hungry, but she felt like she had never eaten anything more delicious. Thank you, Rose, she said, it's very tasty. The acquaintance looked at her in surprise, well, I'll be, she murmured to herself, it's like you're not lying to me. After the women had eaten and thanked Teresa, Rose said, I think we need to talk. I don't like dealing with strangers. Let's go, I'll show you a beautiful place. We'll continue getting to know each other there. They came to a semi-abandoned small park. Rose confidently led Anna somewhere deeper, away from the central paths and alleys. Here's the place, Rose finally said, satisfied. The women arrived at the edge of a small pond surrounded by trees from all sides. Rose confidently laid out her jacket on the grass and sat down, inviting Anna to join. Sit down, it's not cold. Anna sat down nearby. Well, tell me, demanded Rose. What should I tell? How you ended up in this life? Anna sighed, I don't know where to start, and will you believe such a story? The woman smirked, believe me, dear. I've heard so much in my life that there's little that can surprise me. And Anna began telling from the moment she woke up in the forester's house, ending with her escape from Carter. Interesting, Rose said thoughtfully, you did surprise me after all. This story is more interesting than in a series. Anna sighed, I have no slightest idea who I am. Only that there's a husband and a child, and possibly I worked at a hospital at some point. And even that, I'm not sure if it's true. Maybe my brain is trying to fill in the gaps in my memory. Rose found a pebble in the grass, swung, and threw it into the water. It happily skipped, leaving a series of expanding ripples on the pond's surface. Do you want to know my story? she suddenly asked. Anna nodded. Only five years ago, I had my own job, an apartment, Rose began, sadly gazing at the pond, where a family of ducks peacefully swam across the calm surface. What was your job? asked Anna. I was an entrepreneur. Wow. Yeah, I had a chain of stores, one similar to the one where we had breakfast today. Of course, I wasn't very wealthy, but I had enough money for a decent life. And what happened? asked Anna. Rose smiled bitterly. A man. I was married once, a long time ago, and briefly, I divorced. And then I was alone for many years. Lived only for work. And suddenly, I fell in love with a guy much younger than me. Did he work for you? How did you guess? I don't know. Women's intuition, perhaps. Rose chuckled, yes, he worked for me. He was the first one who started taking care of me. Said things no one had ever said to me before. I understand now how foolish I was, but then, I thought it was all real. Anna reached out and touched Rose's hand. Don't say that. If someone betrayed you, it's not because you're foolish or naive. It's because they're deceitful people, unworthy of your trust. Rose gratefully squeezed her hand in response. Thank you. Anyway, I won't dwell on it for long. We got married, and then he persuaded me to transfer all my property to him. The business, the apartment. And you didn't suspect anything? The woman shook her head slowly. I told you, I was in love. And what happened next? Divorce and property division. Well, technically, all the property went to its legal owner, my husband. What a nightmare. Did you seek help anywhere? The woman chuckled. Yes. But everything was arranged as if I willingly gave him all the money. In essence, that's what happened. No violation of the law. I'm so sorry for you. It's not worth it. What happened to you afterward? That's where my mistake was. Instead of pulling myself together and moving on, I ruined everything myself. I started drinking, made strange friends, other alcoholics. Over time, I lost my human face. Woke up God knows where, drank anything that burned. Begged. Even stole. Did a lot of things that I'm ashamed of now. Rose fell silent. Anna didn't know what to say. You don't look like an alcoholic now, she said. The woman smiled, I quit not too long ago, to be honest. 
But, as you can see, I'm still living on the streets. I try not to do the things I did before. Now I'm just a quiet, unnoticeable homeless woman. I'm very sorry. Don't pity me. I'm responsible for where I am now. You've had some tough circumstances. But luck doesn't always favor everyone, but we decide what to do with it ourselves. Some fight and become even stronger and more successful than before. And some, like me, hit rock bottom. I agree with your words about responsibility, but still, you're very hard on yourself. Few would endure what you've been through without breaking. So, don't blame yourself. But there's plenty to blame myself for. Rose sighed. Anyway, now you know everything. Now we need to think about how to help you. Anna interrupted her, you said we need to earn money. Let's start with that. You're such a serious, practical girl. Admirable. It's simple here, we're happy with whatever comes our way. We dig through trash bins, kind people help, we ask for charity, we take up simple jobs. You'll get used to it. Anna adapted quickly. She didn't realize how. Perhaps when there are no options, a person can adapt to anything. She seemed to have entered a new world and started living by its rules. When you want to eat and sleep, you agree to any conditions. Sometimes despair overwhelmed her, thinking she would never find out who she was, that she would fall asleep and freeze in her sleep without waking up. And her loved ones would never know what happened to her. Sometimes hope came to her when it seemed she recognized certain places. She saw memories in fragmented pieces. It's like I once bought a book at this store, she shared with Rose one evening after such an incident. Which one, the woman was keenly interested. Seems like something from the classics, Gogol or Lermontov. But you don't remember for sure? No. Okay, keep walking, keep remembering. Come on, Anna, you'll remember everything else. I've already lost in this game called life, but I won't let you perish. And one day, Anna remembered. At one point, Anna found herself in a neighborhood located at the opposite end of the city. She had never been here before, and suddenly, a familiar vague feeling appeared in her mind. I've definitely been here, she said quietly to herself. At first glance, these were just ordinary houses, but Anna's heart beat faster. She chose a certain street and walked along it. It felt like she had walked this route many times before. Anna stopped near a small shop. There she saw them and immediately recognized them. It was the man and the girl from her dreams. The girl looked older by a few years, but Anna still understood that it was her. The man didn't see her, but the girl looked at her as if she knew her. The girl shouted and pointed at Anna. The man also looked up and glanced her way. In his eyes, there was surprise and horror. And Anna became scared. She ran, not caring about the way. She came to her senses far away from that place. Why did you run away? Rose asked her when Anna told her everything in the evening. Anna shrugged. I don't know. I got scared. What? They might be your family, after all. But I don't remember them. Anna hugged herself. You know how scary it is to see people and not know who they are to you. Rose sighed. How could they be random people if you saw them in your dream? Anna shrugged. Maybe they just look alike. And I made up the rest. I could have just approached and asked. But what if I did something terrible to them? What if I betrayed them, deceived them, ran away from them? What if I left a husband and daughter due to drugs, alcohol, another man, I don't know. Even if that's the case. Whatever the reason. What do you prefer now, to live, tormented by uncertainty, or to find out the truth? Anna fell silent. Okay, she said after a while, the truth. All right, then go back there. It took her a few days to gather her courage. But when she went there again and spent the whole evening near the shop, the man and the girl were not there. She visited there a couple more times but never encountered them again. It seems like we need to change tactics, Rose said. I have no more ideas, Anna admitted. 
You need new memories. Where can I get them? From the same place you got the previous ones. Walking around the city hoping to stumble upon familiar places? Yes. Do you even realize the probability of being in the same place at the same time in our city? Barney asked his sister. She shrugged. Little Baffy, very little. Do you have other ideas? He sighed. Well, here we are. Almost all of Barney's free time was spent visiting places where he and his wife and daughter often frequented. Hope diminished with each passing day, but for some reason, he kept doing it. Come on, Anna, he whispered, steering the wheel and scrutinizing each passerby, let's meet again. I promise I won't lose you anymore. Anna was tired. Nothing. Empty. No new memories. The old sneakers she found on some dump a few months ago were almost falling apart. Her feet hurt, blisters on her feet were bleeding. She licked her dry lips. She felt like crying from helplessness. Ma'am, are you all right? Someone asked her. Yes, Anna said softly. You seem overheated. They helped her sit on a bench in the shade of the trees. Someone handed her a bottle of water. Anna drank, feeling slightly better. Shall I call an ambulance? No need, thank you. I'm feeling better now. The passerby left. Anna looked around. She was sitting in the park, raising her head. No way, she said softly. Before her was a fountain, a round stone basin with a lion standing in the center, from whose mouth a powerful jet gushed. The pedestal with the lion was decorated with small fish. She had seen this fountain before. That meant the dream was real. That meant everything was true. The girl, the man, the ice cream. Anna raised her head and saw him. Right now, the man from her dreams and memories was walking toward her. Could I be hallucinating, she thought. The man was pale as a wall. Anna, is that you, he asked. She swallowed slowly. Barney? The name came to her mind spontaneously. He gently touched her as if not believing that it had actually happened. Now Barney was sure it was Anna. Alive, real, in the flesh. She looked at him with surprise, as if seeing him for the first time. Anna, Anna. He carefully took her hand. Are you my husband? she suddenly asked. Yes, he replied in amazement. Why do you ask? I lost my memory, Anna replied. About three years ago, approximately. Barney flinched. So that's the case. She looked at him hopefully, and at the same time cautiously and a bit scared. Sorry, he said, I rushed to you, and you don't remember me. Wait. He took out his phone, started flipping through something, then showed her a photo. It depicted the three of them embracing near the fountain, Anna, Barney, and the girl. Anna took a deep breath. Is this our daughter? she asked. Yes, her name is Wendy. Wendy, she said slowly. What a beautiful name. Let's go home, he said. They got into the car, and Anna suddenly felt embarrassed. I've practically been living on the streets for the past few months. I'm sorry. Stop it. I'm just happy to have found you. Will I see our daughter now? She's at summer camp, coming back in three days. If you want, we can call her. Anna shook her head. No need. Let her rest peacefully. And I need to prepare myself. He nodded. You saw us then at the shop, he asked. Yes. Why did you run away? I got scared. I hardly remember you. Hardly? Just a few episodes. Like the three of us eating ice cream by the fountain, where you found me. Interesting. What else? Anna blushed. I also remember us kissing under a black and white movie. He smiled. Wow. That's nice. Was that real? Barney nodded. That's how our relationship began. Anna noticed that they were driving through familiar streets. Are we almost there? 
Yes. When they entered the apartment, Anna realized that even though she didn't remember it, she felt good, warm, and familiar here. Do you want to eat or take a shower? Barney asked. Both, if I may start with a shower. He led her to the bathroom. I'll bring your robe and towel. Anna stood in the shower for a long time. She couldn't remember the last time she had showered in comfortable conditions. She trembled with disbelief that this was all happening for real. Afraid that all of this might also turn out unreal, like Carter. She put on a soft, fluffy, lilac bathrobe and remembered how she had also come out of the bathroom in this robe, walked into the kitchen, and knelt down beside Barney. All right. All of this is true. She was actually home. Breathing became a bit easier. Tea or coffee? Barney asked when she entered the kitchen and timidly sat on a chair. It's up to you. Then mint tea. Although, we can have the tea later. He poured her a huge bowl of hot chicken soup, sliced soft white bread, placed a vegetable salad on the table, and after thinking for a moment, reheated another serving of cutlets with rice in the microwave. I must have been a bad wife if you cook so well, Anna said after finishing everything. Barney smirked. We used to cook together. You worked a lot. What was my job? A nurse. Anna nodded contentedly. Yes. That was true too. And then, Barney continued, after your death, I did all the cooking, of course. Death? Anna queried in surprise. I guess it's time I told you everything I know, and then hear your version of events. It took them about two hours to tell each other everything that had happened since their parting. Wow, said Anna, I tried to imagine many things during all this time, but it never crossed my mind that I've been officially dead for three years. Barney sighed. Now you understand the shock I felt when I saw you back then at the shop. I can imagine, Anna suddenly looked sadly at him. It's weird. I don't know how our life will turn out now. He cautiously approached and took her hand. Everything will be fine. Now you're home, we'll manage. Anna slept until noon. She had forgotten how soft and warm a bed could be. Why didn't you wake me up, she asked her husband, coming into the kitchen and seeing him drinking coffee and reading a book. Barney smiled. You looked like you really needed to rest. Yeah, life on the streets isn't good for anyone. Aren't you working today? I took the day off. I want to spend time with you. Thank you. She coughed awkwardly. I'm sorry if I've been a bit distant with you. I understand. It's hard to grasp that you might not remember me, our relationship, our love. Perhaps, you won't want to live with me. I'll understand that. Anyway, I'll be here. I'll support you. Help you settle in life. Don't worry about that. Thank you. You're very kind. Yes, it will take me some time to get used to it. But I worry not about that. I'm afraid I won't be the same person you and Wendy remember. I'm not the same wife, the same mother who left for a week on a business trip three years ago. I don't even know who I am anymore. He stood up and slowly hugged her. That's why we have a family. Wendy and I will love you regardless of any changes. You are our wife and mother. We're with you, Anna. We're here. She quietly cried tears of happiness. A month later, memories started coming back partially, chaotically, fragmented, with bits and pieces, but they were returning. Anna remembered her daughter first. Mommy. Wendy screamed when she saw her returning from camp. Barney had spoken to her beforehand so that the girl wouldn't be too shocked. But she didn't seem surprised at all. Wendy was sure she had seen her mom at the store and had been waiting for them to meet again since then. Anna cried when she hugged her daughter, feeling the familiar, so dearly loved smell of her soft hair on the back of her head. Wendy, my dear. Images flashed before her eyes. She was sitting in the hospital restroom, holding a pregnancy test with two lines. There was Barney, driving her to the hospital, in the middle of the night. The maternity ward, Anna holding a little bundle. Her daughter taking her first steps. 
Anna running early in the morning, leading Wendy by the hand to daycare on the way to work. I knew it was you, mommy. Anna cried, embracing her daughter and inhaling her scent. At some point, Barney couldn't hold back, approached them, and hugged both of them, also starting to cry. What's wrong? Wendy asked, surprised. Everything's good now. We won't let mom go anywhere. Anna approached the old abandoned house. Her heart ached, thinking that she had slept here on the floor not too long ago. Are you sure I shouldn't come with you? Barney asked. Anna shook her head. No, I have to figure this out on my own. It was early morning, she quietly walked down the hallway and climbed to the second floor. Rose was sleeping in the same place as usual. Good morning, Anna said. The woman stretched, yawned, and then opened her eyes. Anna, she asked in surprise. Where have you been? I thought something had happened to you. Something did, Anna replied. I found my family. Rose sat up. Really? Yes. Then congratulations. Is everything okay? Better than ever. And it's all thanks to you. What are you talking about, dear? You gave me a good idea on how to find them. I'm very happy for you, my dear. Anna sat next to her. I didn't come here just because, Anna said. Rose raised her eyebrows. Why then? I want to take you with me. What are you saying, child? You won't live here forever, will you? Rose shrugged. What other options are there? Come with me. The woman shook her head. No, this is my punishment. My cross. I deserve this. Anna took her hand. You've made this up yourself. Even if there was something bad in your life, you've long made up for it through your hard work. Tears rolled down the woman's face. Come with me, Anna gently repeated. You helped me return to life, and I'll help you return as well. Hand in hand, the women left the house. You have a lovely place here, Anna said. They sat on the open veranda of a small cozy house. It was morning. Barney and Wendy were still asleep. Not mine, but yours, the woman corrected her. Thank you for allowing me to stay here. Anna shrugged. We're not garden enthusiasts anyway, and you've managed to organize everything in a month, it's hard to believe. The woman smiled. What else was there for me to do? Read women's novels or watch TV? None of that suits me. Putting things in order around me helps sort out my own thoughts. And have you figured things out? Rose looked at her, squinting cunningly. Seems like it. And all thanks to you. A savior. Anna felt embarrassed. Please don't call me that. If it weren't for you back then, I would have definitely died on the street. Rose shook her head. No, you wouldn't have. You were considered dead, but you didn't die. After something like that, there's no force that could break you. Sometimes I think the same. The women admired the sun rising above the horizon. The world was waking up. Birds celebrated the beginning of a new day with their songs. Everything seemed bright and unreal, like in a fairy tale. Then Anna poured them both some hot herbal tea. How's your memory? Rose asked. Anna shrugged. Not bad. I still don't remember some moments. Maybe I never will. And do you remember something? Yes, a lot. My husband, my daughter, my work. That's wonderful. How are your relationships with Barney? All good. You know, when I was with Carter, it was completely different. He said we'd been married for ten years, that we loved each other, and I believed that. But I didn't feel myself. It was as if he and everything around me were foreign. I constantly wondered how I could live such a life. And with Barney. Everything is completely different with him. Even if he tells me something I don't remember, I feel that it could have happened. That it's in my character. In harmony with my personality, you know? She looked hopefully at her companion. Rose smiled and nodded. 
I'm glad everything's good for you. Me too. You can't imagine what he went through during these years. Rose nodded thoughtfully, sipped her tea, and said, Sometimes I try to understand why fate sends us such trials. Everyone's different. Some have easy ones, others very difficult. And some just go through life without noticing any difficulties. Anna smiled. And what conclusion did you make after such thoughts? The woman chuckled, I don't know, I make different ones every time. Sometimes I feel there's no fate and it's all just coincidences and random events. Other times, I think it's all a divine plan that we'll never understand. Anna nodded. I prefer the second version because it implies that our meeting is part of such a plan. Rose smiled warmly and looked at her friend. I have another version that people go through such experiences to help each other. That a person's greatest wealth in this world is helping another person. There's friendship, Anna said, and love. Her companion nodded seriously. Yes, those two. I don't know if it's appropriate to say this, Anna said, but I don't regret everything that happened to me. Me neither, said Rose. It's all part of my path. Perhaps it was necessary, and without it, I wouldn't be who I am now. Exactly, agreed Anna. And I would have never had such a strong, wonderful friend. Me neither. Also, I wouldn't have valued my life, my husband, my child, and this whole world as much. At that moment, voices were heard somewhere behind them, and Barney and Wendy appeared on the veranda. The girl rubbed her eyes sleepily. Aunt Rose, Mom, Wendy said, displeased, you're up early again. The women exchanged glances and smiled. It's a habit from our past life, dear, Rose said. You just can't get rid of it so easily. Why are you up so early? Anna asked her husband and daughter. Barney shrugged. We decided to keep you company. It's too good a morning to spend it in bed. Yeah, Wendy said seriously, life is too short to miss such moments. The adults pondered for a few seconds, surprised by the child's wisdom, then laughed together.